So thank you for coming, everybody, and thank you for having me here. So my name is Anna, and I'm an artist, and I'm also this co-founder of this goal. And uh, I'm going to talk about hidden art in general a little bit, and then about the spe special painting that I just completed for Botska Palace. And uh, I work in a realistic style of painting, and uh, this way of painting is... <laughs> Not that, I mean, for many people, they think this is sort of extinct, this way of working. Very, very often I meet people who say, well, I didn't know you could paint like this anymore. I didn't know you have the knowledge to do this. And uh, if you look in the art history books, it might look like this type of art died out in the early 20th century. Because, you know, a lot of things happened right then, 1920, you could say. And uh, this sort of has disappeared out of the books anyway. But of course there's been painters working like this anyway, on the side. You can take the next picture. So we are most of us familiar with Picasso, and uh, this painting is from 1907, I think most of us have seen. Uh, the next picture shows this fountain from 1917, and it's quite amazing to think that it was done 1917. <laughs> you know, it's like, you feel like, if you have seen Downton Abbey or something like that, you know, I think it's so strange to see this on the same time it happened at the same time. And um, uh, that was a huge breakthrough and art really changed at this time. And uh, the way we look upon art or how we, what the concept of what art is changed at this time. Uh, before, you know, the standards or the way that how one judged what was good art or not good art was had been the same for hundreds of years. But at this time it really, it, it went away. It was a clean break, really, with the past. And uh, from this on, a lot of the, you know, for example, like craftsmanship isn't important or necessary anymore in art. Beauty isn't important or necessary. Sort of direct emotional impact isn't necessary either. But uh, what's most important is the intellectual background to the art piece or the concept or the idea. So it's, it's a very big change what happened then. So a lot of artists went this way, and of course those artists that sort of led the way, they are very important, and when you write the art history, you write about them. But we sort of forget all those other artists that also worked, who sort of did not break with the history, they kept working in the same way as you had done. They were contemporary artists, they believed in what they did, and sort of just, but they had other values. And they are sort of like hidden artists, you could say, so that's why I'm bringing this up. I want to share a few of them with you today. And uh, so, almost everyone knows Cezanne, I imagine, that's here. Uh, but basically the same years as he worked, Fontaine Latour worked as well. And it's very fun because they are really similar, and he's also from France. And he was a very, very successful painter when he lived. He painted mostly still lives, but also portraits and figurative work, and was, yeah, very, very successful. But he was not in fashion, so he sort of disappeared as when he, you know, when he died or <laughs> later in history. And the next slide, uh, we can see this painting by Matisse, one that I think almost everyone has seen before. I saw it already when I was a child and have been sort of known, it's been part of my life too. Uh, but this other painter from Italy, Sartorio, this, he's also been a great painter and I just found out about him some weeks ago. I saw an image by him and I've looked him up and it's, he's an amazing painter. The next slide we can see here is Picasso, of course. Everybody's very familiar with him. And uh, this is a portrait of, a, or of an artist in, and his model. And uh, about the same time as this painting was painted, like in the 70s, this painting was painted by John Koch, who is a very interesting artist from America, who also was very successful during his time. And uh, a supported painter, painted interiors and still lives and very successful when he lived, but almost completely forgotten at this time. 
And then we have uh, Pollock and uh, Anigoni, that they are born about the same time and worked on the same time. And it's so interesting to see that those types of art is happening beside each other. And uh, Anigoni is a very famous painter in realistic art. He's uh, very important. He painted portraits. He, was, he painted the Queen Elizabeth in England many times and other important people in England. He went to America and painted a president there. So very well known during his lifetime. Also in Italy, of course, doing a lot of frescoes and so on. But also quite forgotten at this time or hidden away in a way. So it's just nice to look at those paintings and also sort of bring them out and see that they, they did exist, even though it uh, can seem like they didn't, you know, when you look in the books. And uh, when I put the pictures side by side like this, I think it's important not to sort of look upon it as a judgment or something like that. It's like it's, it's just two different ways of working and both are fine. And you can maybe like something more or less, but it's not a judgment. And uh, it's more that it's nice to bring forth some artists that have been hidden. And uh, the, so I work in this way and my, I can sort of follow my teachers back in time and we all work this way. We all feel like contemporary painters, but we use this type of language, you could say. And uh, very important when you work like this is to learn to see. And a big part of uh, when we train students in this art is just to open the eyes. It's much more than, the, it's very little really what you do with the hands. It's the biggest part is what you do with your eyes and how you can actually see things. And, uh, and it's like that, you know, there's so much around you all the time, but you don't see it because you're not made aware of it and you have to have help to sort of really understand what it is. And what we practice is to see what makes something look real. And we do it through a lot of studies, drawings from casts and uh, a lot of that, and then figure drawings, of course, and figure studies of different kinds, also painting and so forth. It goes very step by step, but the whole time it is training the eye, it's exercise, it's just to make your eyes sharper and sharper so that you can see what's, what's real. And uh, in many ways, it's, it's quite mentally tax tax taxing to just do this and get into this. Um, it's, you have to have a lot of patience. And it's slow art, you could say, doing this kind of painting. But that's good in our time to slow down a little bit and sort of give things time. And uh, more than just about, you know, it's more than just seeing and learning to see. It's also about learning to appreciate things. And uh, I think uh, I find that being one of the most important things to sort of see things and appreciate what you see, even in the most simplest things, just enjoy how the light falls on the surface or something like that and just see how beautiful that is and then translate that into a painting and then you can give that feeling off to other people and sort of lift things up and for me that's very important and uh, anyway for two years ago about I was given a great opportunity to sort of use this way of working uh, or this skill set that I have as a realistic painter and then also to express myself, my own sort of personal vision through this project. And uh, it's a palace that's also quite well hidden. No, most people don't know about this place. It's called Botska Palace. It's located very close to here. If you know where Grand Hotel is, it's right behind Grand Hotel. And uh, it was built 1664 and uh, by Bot commissioned it. And, uh, were from uh, seven, no, what was it, 1874, the Freemasons uh, took it over. It's their headquarters and it still is. So therefore also it's kind of sort of hidden away because it is a secret society. So it's not open for everybody. You can go for tours there but and see a few of the rooms. And uh, anyway, in there, there is, it's a, this is how it looks now. And on the top two floors there, that's the windows into the big, Hall of Celebrations, it's called Oscar Salen. And uh, this room has, th this is the inside of the room. And uh, for many years it was, I mean it has for hundreds of years or whatever, it's been uh, not clean basically. So it was very dark and dirty, the ceilings and the, all the plaster work, which is extremely beautiful. It's very, you know, it's sculptures all along the walls and decorations, but it was very dark. and. Uh, 
then they decided to clean it. And after they had done that, they sort of for the first time really saw the ceiling and that it, it was empty, basically. I mean, they knew that it was empty, but they didn't think about it before because it wasn't so apparent. And uh, the reason it was, it's empty still is that the boat who commissioned the palace, he died exactly sort of when it was finished. So they didn't exactly finish the palace. This ceiling was left empty. And that's quite unique that a ceiling in a Baroque palace is empty and uh, very, very special to get a commission like this to paint the ceiling in a Baroque palace like this. And uh, also it's very special as a woman to get a commission like this because there isn't many palace ceilings painted by women in the past or now. You know, so that felt also very nice that it actually shows the women, even though they are a, a society only for men. So that's very nice. And uh, yeah, so they chose me because I have this knowledge about how to paint realistically. And uh, they wanted this painting to fit into the palace. So it, but on the same time be contemporary. It shouldn't look as if it was painted some hundreds years ago or, or try to look like that. And uh, that was mostly what they said. And I just got, okay, come up with an idea for this now. And that was quite hard because when you get that open directions, you, can, you sort of feel like you see everything up in that ceiling. And it took me quite a while to come up with a good idea that sort of fitted. And then uh, I, I worked on that for some months, actually. And then I came up with an idea that I presented to them. This is uh, some studies I was working, putting you know, different studies and sketches. And then I came up with a small, this is just a small little study, which kind of expressed the idea that I wanted to have in the ceiling. And they accepted it. And then I started working. And then it took about a year to just do preparatory work for this painting and then seven months about to paint the actual big painting. And doing a painting like this, it's so big, so you really have to prepare everything. Because if you can't really sort of start just painting on the painting and then something is wrong and you have to start over, but it's too big. And also everything that you do in one corner plays with another corner, so you have to plan very much. And a lot of the work I was doing tons of sketches and reworking all the poses until they worked because it's a very complex perspective to you know, have to sort of feel like you're looking up but still see the figures, so you have to work it out. And a lot, you couldn't really be, I'm used to work very realistically, I sort of just look at my model and I do what I see, but here I had to sort of paste different figures together to make it look interesting from that view. And uh, I did all kinds of different things. I worked with live models and did sculptures and things just to be able to get the perspective to work. And uh, so when I sort of each figure, each little part in that painting, I worked out with small drawings and then bigger drawings, life-size drawings, and eventually painted studies. And then when I had all of that put together, I sort of had to shrink them all into a modello where I, so that I could see that everything worked together. And uh, here you see some more drawings from the process. I and mean, I have hundreds of this. Many things didn't even come into the painting in the end because you, know, you had to try different things. You had to try to put the groups together and make them work. And here is the modello. So this is a two meter high painting where each sort of separate figure has been put together sort of to fit together. And, uh, and you sort of measure out the size and and kind of it works out. And uh, after that, this is a detail of the little modello where everything is sort of shrunk down to this size. And then from this size, this is the actual painting, an image from the painting. Uh, you sort of have to measure everything out again and make it large and actually life size. Those sort of lower figures are life size. And uh, here is a lot of other studies from this process. I worked only traditional when I worked on this painting. And uh, Partly because I just wanted to, it felt fun to just say, I'm going to do it just like they would have done it and not use other you know, media to help me. But then also I do wanted to do this the very best I could. I felt this is a historical painting. It's not like when you just paint a normal painting and can hang it on the wall and it can be taken down. This painting is going to sit up in that ceiling and be part of this building as long as the building is there. It's a historical work. So somehow, I had to put in every effort I just could to do it the best way. And for example, working from photographs can make it easier when you work, you know, it's easy to copy, but uh, it doesn't give the best results. So I worked with live models with all the figures in this painting. And uh, it was challenging sometimes, the line of floor, has to get the view. I work with children that modeled for me for the painting. 
and they, of course, never sit still, so they had to look at a lot of movies and <laughs> just try to work and learn to work with it. But it was, I mean, it was a lot of challenges through this whole thing because it was so big and you're not used, nobody's used to work with big paintings like this. I mean, I couldn't go and ask somebody, how do you do this? Because I didn't know anyone who did this and not up with that sort of perspective and in the ceiling and all that. So it was a lot of different things that had to be sort of figured out through the trip of the, uh, this painting. And, but it's, uh, it was just a wonderful challenge to go through. Here we are putting Imprimatura on the big canvas outdoors because it's it's very toxic when you work with turpentine like this, and it's so big. Here, starting to put the first layer on the painting on the ground just to save a little bit of time. And uh, then came the next step. I started to actually work in the palace on this big painting. And uh, it was really wonderful. I actually got to work in the room that it was going to be sitting in. And that was quite special to actually go and work every day in this palace. Just walk up those stairs and then feel like you're a court painter or something, you know. And uh, then uh, the first part was to transfer each drawing from that little thing, look at the, all the studies and then get the measurements right to the big painting. And I had to do some changes while I did that to make it really fit well. And uh, so that took, that's one of the things I hadn't really realized how, how much time that would take in this process. Here I'm standing in the palace working starting to get the stuff in and uh, just painting on. Had to work from scaffoldings for the first time. I've never done that before. And uh, that was interesting and fun to have done, but not maybe the easiest thing to do because you have to kind of climb down the whole way and then go back and look what you've done and try to see what you <laughs> painted and climb up again because it's just it's shading, you know, what you're doing. And uh, here I'm coming towards the end of this painting. And uh, here are signing it. So that was a sort of funny experience to sign a painting this big. I was like, shall I really sign it just in the corner? It felt really weird, but I did it. So that was fun. And uh, so then I thought I can just tell a little bit about the story, about the painting, sort of what it's expressing. So in this room, there is a lot of plaster work all around the walls. It's uh, prisoners bound and lots of war trophies. And, um, so it was, it's sort of like an expression of power through violence, you could say, you know. And uh, so my painting in a way should reverse that, was the thought. And uh, in, in this painting now, we have prisoners as well, so it ties into the room. So there's prisoners sitting on the bottom uh, or in the ground, in the earth, but they are not prisoners of war but prisoners of, uh, sort of their own false beliefs or assumptions or ignorance and so forth. And uh, they sort of represent most people in a way, and uh, in this story kind of. And then through, uh, if you see above them, there sits a group of pe or several people then that have direct light on them and uh, are illuminated by the light and by wisdom. And those are helping those prisoners that are down there. And uh, in the middle, we have a group of charity. I based it on the Freemasons, sort of most important group. Uh, uh, yeah, like the charity, uh, brotherhood, and uh, sort of inner self-development, and knowledge and learning and teaching. Those were the three sort of core subjects I wanted to have in it. So anyway, we have a charity group there who is sort of stretching out, giving bread to one of the prisoners who can symbolize wisdom and help that's going to sort of strengthen him when he goes up through this journey. And uh, we have uh, like an older man who has accumulated lots of knowledge through his lifetime and gives that on to the young boy who stands there. The boy has sort of an inner wisdom from the start, like all children have, but uh, also takes the knowledge from the older man. He holds water who is flowing down and giving strength to, the, to one of the prisoners there. And water has a lot of symbolic meaning to it. The whole painting has a lot of symbols, but I'm just going to take a little, very short story right now. And um, so that's there. And then we have another group standing here on the corner. That's two brothers, you could say, who holds their hands on the shoulders of each other. And they also symbolizes the two columns that are very important in the Freemason symbolism. And through those, this other 
pres or new, the soul of that person is going up and then getting together with this group of people who is moving towards a symbol for wisdom and sort of, yeah, light. And now you can't see it at all here, but from this light figure in the middle that is sort of symbol source energy or what you could say, there's also going a lot of dark figures away, which is symbolizing the negative energies. It's like anger, fear, sloth or greed and so forth. They're going away. And uh, so, yeah, basically this image now it's sitting up in the ceiling there. It looks absolutely terrible on this image. It doesn't do that in real life. But uh, it's sitting up in this wonderful ceiling and in a way it's sort of, you know, if, if you imagine this room with all those prisoners and war trophies all around, it's a very beautiful room but still, you know, has that, that image around it. Now we have this image in there which sort of reverses all of that where rather you talk about sort of power through wisdom and inner self-development. So that's my painting and uh, with that, I, yeah, I want to end with saying that I think it's important to think about art as it's, you know, it's a lot about fashion going through art. And uh, it's important that everyone follows their own voice rather than, you know, feeling that they have to go with something that is, you know, coming here and then going away. So whatever you feel that you want to paint or do or what you like to look at, because sometimes you feel like we get kind of directed what is good art and bad art. Just feel what you like and uh, follow that. And also it's uh, important to look a little bit further and look at all those other things that are around us that are hidden and you don't see right away. Just look for other things that's not just placed for you. So, well, thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs>